Hey, what's up? I'm Mr. Hanish. Welcome to my flip classroom. We are filming today from my basement because the roads are icy and school's canceled. Today we check out Northern Europe and its two very distinct regions of the Nordic countries and the British Isles, both of which hold a special place in my heart. The Nordic countries, due to Finland's awesome education system, which I constantly refer to and compare our American system to in class, if you've noticed that yet, and the British Isles for giving us One Direction. Or what? I mean, One Direction? I, I don't like One Direction. I mean, I'm an adult and a guy. I, they're okay, I guess. Whatever. No, for real, the British Isles are important to me because of Chelsea FC, professional soccer, and James Bond fictional secret agent. Well, enough about my personal ties, let's talk about physical geography. Northern Europe is completely made of islands and peninsulas, which means water plays a large role there. Long ago, glaciers moving through the area carved huge chunks out of the western coast of Norway, and when they melted, they created inlets of water surrounded by mountains known as fjords. That's right, there's a J in there, but it sounds like a Y. To best describe what a fjord looks like, all I can say is, Think Arendelle. Seriously, the movie Frozen is likely set in what would be present-day Norway. Now, melting glaciers also form most of the lakes in this region as well. Very important. Based on the latitude of this area, you might expect incredibly cold temperatures, frozen icy landscapes, but because of the water, that's really not the case. The North Atlantic Drift is an ocean current that brings warm, moist air, which has a moderating effect on the climate. The British Isles, Denmark, Southern Iceland, and Western Norway actually receive plentiful rainfall in short winters, while the rest of Norway, Sweden, and Finland have a continental climate with four true seasons, much like here in Wisconsin. Northern Iceland and the far northern reaches of Norway, Sweden, and Finland are closer to the freezing tundra you might expect for something at that latitude. Thanks to the climate and fairly level land with fertile soil, the southern British Isles and southern Nordic countries actually have very good farmland. The northern Nordic countries are much more mountainous though, making farming more difficult. But there are plenty of other resources, such as oil and gas deposits in the North Sea, and there's timber throughout Norway, Sweden, and Finland. There's fishing in the Atlantic and North Sea, hydroelectric power from rivers and streams, and geothermal energy created by the hot springs of Iceland. Now let's break down each region to examine some important history notes and look at the culture, governments, and economies of today. The British Isles has some of the most important history of anywhere in the world, but we'll overly simplify it. According to historians and paleontologists and whatnot, there were people in the British Isles about 5,000 plus years ago, but we're really not going to worry about roughly 4,000 of those 5,000 years. A thousand years ago, a bunch of groups came into the British Isles and created small kingdoms, and in 1066 they unified and became modern England, which over the next 500 years would become fabulously wealthy and build up a huge navy that would be able to travel around the globe claiming lands for England's empire in the 16, 17, and 1800s. Most of the reason for creating an empire was to collect raw materials to send home to fuel the industrial revolution of that time, which really saw England jump to the forefront of world power and become arguably the most advanced country on earth. That wasn't quite enough to stop rebellions in certain areas of the empire though. America! But let's just say they were doing pretty well overall. They took that opportunity to unify further into what is now the United Kingdom a combination of England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. It's at this point we should take a break and make sure you understand the difference between England, Great Britain, and the United Kingdom. Because many people use them interchangeably, but that's just wrong. England is a nation. It can also be referred to as a country, but it's not an independent country. Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland all fall under the same category. Combined, the four of them form the United Kingdom. That's the actual state. The government and economy and everything else associated with an independent country operates as the United Kingdom. Most people think of the United Kingdom as British, but that's also not correct since Britain is just the physical island containing England, Scotland, and Wales. So, if you're English, you're British. But if you're British, you might not be English. But you're definitely not Irish but you could be Irish and be part of the UK. Got it? Good. Okay. Yeah, me too. Cool. <clears throat> anyway, by the time World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II came along, the idea of a global empire really no longer made sense because they were dirt poor and kind of just fought two wars on the whole principle of countries being free to choose their leaders and make their own decisions, which made their empire look super hypocritical. 
What the empire accomplished as a lasting impact today is the spread of the English language, which is now the most common business language in the world and often the most popular second language to learn in non-English speaking countries. English sports such as football, you mean soccer, football was invented in America, rugby and cricket are now popular in the Middle East, South and East Asia, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand and the South Pacific because of their spread during the age of British Empire. Economically and politically, the United Kingdom and Ireland are EU members and neighbors that still don't quite trust each other. Ireland was in a very similar boat as Greece, Spain, and Portugal around 2008-ish, if you recall from a previous video, but they have become one of the biggest post-global recession success stories, and their unemployment levels have stabilized, and Ireland has attracted lots of investment from foreign businesses. The United Kingdom, in the meantime, has become very skeptical of the EU idea. And in fact, in the summer of 2016, they held a referendum, or single political question that was put out to a vote for a direct decision. And they asked their citizens in this referendum if they should stay in the EU or leave. After a campaign of name-calling, mudslinging, and fear-mongering from both sides, the UK voted to leave the EU. The decision has popularly become known as Brexit like a combination of British and exit. The referendum results are not a guarantee though as several political and logistical details must still be worked out and no official Brexit would likely take place until at least 2019. But part of the reason they voted to leave the union is they have needed to play the role of lender and use their relative economic stability to help member nations that were struggling. Giving loans out to other countries has been a thorn in the side of their economy but it's not the only issue the UK faces right now. Scotland has gone to referendum on possible independence from the UK, and that is probably, probably a debate that will continue for some time as opinions on the matter are relatively evenly split. A 2015 vote did not result in independence, but many Scots were against the Brexit vote in 2016, so perhaps the results would be different now. Over in the Nordic countries, the history makes us think of one thing and one thing only, Vikings. The Vikings were great sailors, explorers, and warriors, and quickly plundered many local kingdoms throughout the region. After the age of the Vikings ended about 1,000 years ago, the kingdom of Denmark became the most powerful in the region, and that kingdom ran the kingdoms of Norway, Sweden, and Finland, but did it all relatively peacefully. It all shook out okay for each country, and everyone had gained their independence by the early 1900s. Recently, the countries of Iceland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland have largely stayed out of international problems and focused on turning themselves into some of the world's most economically and socially successful countries in the world. For instance, all five of those countries are ranked in the top 38 in the world for GDP per capita, ranking them higher than the EU average and notable countries such as the UK. What is perhaps most impressive is they have maintained high income while also providing for their people, evidenced by all five ranking among the 27 lowest infant mortality rates and the wonderful education systems there. Compared to the United States, Finland starts schooling at a later age, goes to school fewer hours per day and fewer days per year, gives less homework and fewer standardized tests, and this means they consistently outperform U.S. students in academics. In fact, the five Nordic countries rank among the top six developed countries in education expenditures, so you know it's important to them. The U.S. comes in around uh, 26th in that category. Besides education, I would like to point out some other really awesome aspects of Nordic life. First of all, the summer is a time to take extended holiday with family and friends. In Sweden, for instance, many businesses run significantly reduced hours in July while they take off for lake house hideaways where they fish, swim, read, sightsee, and just relax for up to a month. The drink of choice for Nordics is coffee. Coffee earned this role partially because of how far north they are in latitude, which leads to shorter daylight hours in the winter months, meaning they fuel up on caffeine to stay awake easily in the dark. You won't find a 12-car line at the drive through of the Helsinki Starbucks on their way to the office, though. Coffee in Nordic countries is meant to be enjoyed from an actual mug, sitting at an actual table while reading a newspaper or chatting with a friend. Nordics also love the sauna. The intense heat is seen as a way to release feelings of tension as well as physical toxins in the body. Many people will head straight from the sauna to go jump into a freezing lake in the wintertime as well. Fun! 
And then possibly my favorite thing about life in the Nordic countries, these five countries lead the world in number of heavy metal bands per capita. So I think I probably got a little too biased in my viewpoints on this video. I realize the Nordic countries are probably not for everyone, especially if you think long work hours, privatized healthcare, and military spending are the way to go. I don't necessarily know which country that we live in fits that bill. America! But just saying, it's possible not everyone is as enamored with the region as I am. If I offended you with my beliefs that Finland has life figured out, I apologize. But for now, go study, and until next time, bye bye Drink my coffee on holiday in the sauna. I said, Oh, yeah.